all of us on the cancer team are probably the one group here in the room trying to put ourselves out of business. We'd love for our services to not be needed. And what I really want to do is start with sort of a description of what I think uh, we'll accomplish today. And sadly, it won't be that aha moment where I unleash the secret that we've been holding on how do we all guarantee ourselves we can avoid cancer. But I do hope that we leave with a better and maybe deeper understanding of the right questions we should be asking uh, to say how do we achieve our best health and how do we have our best chance of avoiding cancer. And I'm going to do that by starting with a question that I'm asked most commonly when people find out I'm an oncologist, which is some variation of really, um, is cancer something we just have to live with? Is this something that is destined to be, or are there things we can do to help prevent uh, that occurrence? And if we're going to start a uh, discussion on, on cancer, there we go, on cancer, then we really have to understand what cancer is. And at the fundamental step, and if we're going to um, understand cancer, we have to first start with the understanding those are us. Those are our cells. They're just misbehaving and not following sort of the rules that we've set. They're lumping up, clumping up, wanting to spread, and we need to understand how to fix then the environment we've set for them to give them the best uh, ability to survive. And what we've understood about cancer is it is a multi-step process. It's not a one thing happening event. Uh, for some patients, it may be starting with some genetics. Maybe our mom and dad gave us some risks that, that we we're uh, born with. And then we might have an infection like human papillomavirus that puts us at even more risk of cancer. And then we may have an inflammatory event in our body with different medical conditions or even expose ourselves to or be exposed to toxins. And all those steps may lead up to developing cancer. And I, I like one analogy a patient gave me and he said, ah, well, this, this sounds like a, a, a car accident then. One, there's some things we could do that set ourselves more at risk of that. We might go out with some friends at night, have a little something to drink, get behind the wheel when we shouldn't, speed home, turn off the lights, red, run red lights, and that certainly increases our chances of being in an auto accident. But there's people who make it home every night with those circumstances. On the other hand, some of us are sitting with our hands at 10 and 2 and um, driving the speed limit, obeying all the rules, and we can still be in an accident. And so cancer's that same way. We could do everything right, and yes, there may be some challenges that we face, and our, probably our pediatric population tells us that best. But there are definitely events we can try to avoid. And so we're really gonna explore again, do our choices have consequence? And maybe more specifically, is cancer linked to those choices? And I'm gonna start with the easy one, which is tobacco use. If we look at the graph here, it sort of shows, and it's small up there, but where the graph is at its lowest, then that's around 1900 to 1930, and lung cancer was a very non-existent thing in the United States. And in the 1930s, we chose to, to indulge a little bit more in tobacco, and as that incidence went up and peaked in the 1970s, almost 20 years to the date, the second curve over is the death rate from lung cancer. So it took 20 years, but almost an exact replica of the use to cancer death mimics one another. And now that it's going down the use, we're seeing 20 years to the date, luckily the death rate from cancer of the lung going down. So what though was the main risk from uh, cancer death at the turn of the century? Was it lung cancer again, or breast cancer, prostate cancer? Surprisingly, and again, this is too small for me to read from here, so I'm sure it is for you too, but at the very edge of that curve is stomach cancer. The turn of the century, stomach cancer was the number one cause of death in the United States. As we started developing, though, refrigeration and, and stopped curing our foods in the same manner, now stomach cancer is a very rare occurrence to have. So our consequences, or our actions had effect and consequence. Sadly, we replaced that with lung cancer and the curve shot way up even above stomach cancer with lung cancer. Now lung cancer is coming down, but we have to ask ourselves, instead of being reactionary, what's coming next? What's going to replace lung cancer? And this might not be a surprising graph, and, and we can all see red from a far distance, and red usually doesn't mean such a good thing. 
1992, the first little state up there or in, the, in the top, these are the number of states that were in crisis with obesity. And we had very few in crisis, none in fact. By 2006, we only had two lone states standing in a non-crisis situation with obesity in this country. And I'll sadly tell you, Utah was the last holdout and it fell nearly five years ago. So we have a whole country in crisis for obesity. And should that matter to us? Well, this we can explore in these little circles represent sort of the effects of different conditions on the leading cause of death in the United States. And the two biggest circles are yellow being heart disease currently and orange being cancer, which dwarfs all the other risks uh, combined. We can fit all those circles into those two many times over. A different way to look at this would be the one side, the blue, the top two lines being um, cancer and heart disease again as the leading cause of death. This is around 2000. But I'd really explain that more as a symptom or a sign or an end event than the actual cause. The orange is more the cause which says tobacco and dietary changes are absolutely at the heart of that decision. And again, this curve was back in 2000. Um, sadly, uh, the obesity and diet changes have now surpassed tobacco as the leading cause of death for this country. Now how we can link then cancer to possibly our dietary changes or um, cancer risk is we've gotten away from thinking things in silos. We used to think in a heart, a lung, a cancer, diabetes mindset instead of understanding this is just you. It's your whole body. We have to understand if we put risk at one place, another risk goes up with it. Luckily, if we fix some of those risks, all the risks go down together. At the more granular level, what we're starting to understand about why we have to be concerned about obesity, why we have to be concerned about our diet, comes from this slide. Obesity is a symptom as well, and it's a symptom of something called metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is an inflammatory condition that the body has to live in that's mimicked by we gain a little extra weight, we maybe have something called borderline blood pressure, borderline diabetes, borderline this, that, and the other, showing that we're starting on a path to where our body does not like the environment we're creating. The end part of that metabolic syndrome is when we truly then start needing to medicate those conditions and the next step beyond a life of nearly 20 years of metabolic syndrome is end events, heart attacks, strokes, cancer. And that's why that curve, if we think back to that lung cancer uh, curve, use versus when we see the condition has that time difference of nearly 20 years. More specifically though, we've come to understand when we gain weight, most of us gain weight in fat cells. It's not muscle, it's not bone, it's, it's fat cells. And we need fat. Fat's a very important part of our body. But we've often thought of it like a blubber layer, and that's not at all what it is. It's a part of our endocrine organ, much like our thyroid gland or our pituitary gland. It's a glandular organ that's very important to our function. But when we get too much of it, it's being what we call deemed toxic fat. And toxic fat, unfortunately, starts putting out enzymes into our body. Now they've been given a name, adipokines, or fat cell enzymes. And this little wheel uh, to the side there of uh, alphabet soup of letters is really the who's who's list of everything we've been trying to turn off in cancer for the last 30 years. Everything that we know drives the cause of cancer and really shares a similar uh, correlation with heart disease the fat cells dump in buckets when we get to a certain level. So we have to address this if we're not going to see the same health crisis we saw with smoking now come from obesity. The Lancet, a uh, well-respected medical journal, uh, often looks at what are the risks to different countries and burdens uh, on society, and they've clearly identified uh, the American diet as the major risk we all face. Uh, right now. It has changed in such a dramatic way in such a short time period. We have to look at that awareness and say, is that what we want to move forward with? I'll interject even a personal note of with my military background. If you look at the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, main risk, 
when he was asked, what is the main risk to our country from a military perspective, the answer was obesity. He can no longer get men and women to serve in the military who are of physical standards to meet any physical standards for the military, and it is making it hard to have recruits serve who even want to. So again, this spectrum crosses widely. So here's some statistics that we can look at. We're, we're just past this now, but, but roughly 56% of the calories we all ingest are from things we were never genetically designed to have. Refined sugars, trans fats, bleached flowers, these uh, things. Our bodies aren't designed to handle that. So how much we give it may express what kind of burden we put our body under. 90% of the money we spend on diet or on uh, nutrition currently in the U.S. is spent on processed foods. If we take all of us, then, and I don't drink soft drinks, some of you may not drink soft drinks, so someone gets my percentage, but if we took all of us, about 70% or 7%, sorry, of the calories Americans consume today come just from soft drinks. And when we look at fast food spending, again, this is an outdated slide because in 1970 we sent, spent about six billion on uh, fast food. By the uh, 2000s, about 10, uh, or sorry, uh, 110 billion, and we've more than doubled that in this uh, short time period. And we're currently to a state where we have asked uh, for um, a meat level to where we eat currently about a million animals an hour in the U.S. That's the, probably the response we should have. That's a staggering result. We can't handle having a million animals an hour. That is an unnatural event. And so I've talked to some of my patients who have worked in that industry, and they said, listen, we're not out to get anybody. You're asking for it. We're trying to figure out how to serve the need that you've asked for. So for some of our colleagues in poultry, the current industry standard changed about two years ago from now hatchling to eight pound, which if you ever lived on a farm, most chickens don't make it to eight pounds, but now all of them need to make it to eight pounds and they need to do it in four weeks. So if you think that the food that we eat does not have effect on our body, whatever we give that chicken to make it uh, eight pounds in four weeks is what we consume. So that is a challenge we've seen in healthcare is patients who feel they're doing all the right things for their diet, but yet are still having difficulty achieving their goals on an ideal body weight. And if we don't start understanding some of these things that we're asking for and, and maybe choose to ask for something different, I don't know that we solve the problem. Now this is a map of meat consumption worldwide, and again, red usually isn't a good thing. And we outpace everyone except Australia in meat consumption by a, quite a, a long stretch. Now why else would, and again, probably till my 30s, if you put something green on my plate, it's going back to the kitchen and, and I enjoy meat as much as anyone else. But I have to pay attention to the science. And the science says even when we have a good source of meat, limiting that meat is what we did for many, many years and why we may need to get back to that because it's a very inflammatory process. So for example, I get a nice piece of steak, I cook it. That protein structure that we talk about, oh, it's a good protein source. That protein structure does a process called agglutination. It hardens. It's like taking a piece of clay and putting it in the kiln and hardening it. You don't get to make your vase a plate the next day. It's hardened into a structure. Those protein structures harden and agglutinate, and to break them down, to use them in our body, is a very inflammatory process. Now, if we balance that, with a very anti-inflammatory component like vegetables, well, that's better for our body. If we only have meat and other inflammatory processes, we're again creating the most uh, inflammatory environment we can have. So is there data to support that uh, a plant-based diet may be of value to us? Here's just one slide showing it, which uh, shows the heart attack and cancer risk in red, and the green bar being the percentage of vegetable-based, unrefined foods that a uh, country eats. Sadly, we're lumped over with Hungary and Belgium as some of the worst consumers of meat to plant, and our disease burden is significantly higher than almost any other country. On the other hand, we take at the very 
far end of the spectrum, what we might consider the more impoverished nations even of Laos and Thailand and Korea and Mexico. And yet their health is far beyond ours, but their plant consumption well exceeds ours as well. I like this quote from Dr. Uh, Esselstyn, who some of you might know from taking care of people like Bill Clinton and things, but he's got a neat story. And he's, his story was told in a documentary called uh, uh, Forks Over Knives, using forks instead of his knife because he was a cardiovascular surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic. And he grew up on a dairy farm as a young boy and had a more traditional meat-based diet. But as he started seeing patients, uh, some of them would have, for example, 90% blockage of their coronary arteries and weren't surgical options, weren't even a stent option. And he and put them on a very, very strict plant-based diet. And he saw not only the 90% blockage stabilize, but he shows all of these scans that he did where the blockage actually disappears and goes back to normal with just plant-based uh, changes. So we have true science examples of where we can reverse certain conditions in our body if we feed it the right environment. And so his quote, and I like to take the time to read this one because I think it's important. Some people think a plant-based diet, whole food diet is extreme. Half a million people will have their chest opened up and a vein taken from their leg and sewn onto their coronary artery. Some people would call that extreme. So again, we have to reframe how we look at what extreme is, what solutions are to how we fix our problems. And cancer fits in this discussion. I, I get this question a lot and I had it for myself, which is, well, what about the protein? I, I heard we need lots of protein for, to, to maintain our health. There's good protein in plants and we have hundreds of articles showing plant-based protein showing wellness and health we sadly have similar articles showing increase in uh, disease states with uh, meat-based uh, proteins. Or won't I be hungry if I just eat like a rabbit? That's the other uh, common question. This picture is an example of why you don't see people sitting and eating um, bag after bag of broccoli until they can't stand anymore, yet we might do that with chips or, or other things. When we fill our stomach with vegetables, 400, uh, I think that says calories on the example, of fruits and vegetables fill the stomach with a much more um, healthy way than oils and, and meats. Secondarily, our body is built on nutrition. We're really nutritarians. I like that new word people are coining, nutritarians. Our body craves nutrition, and the more nutrition you give it, the more satisfied your body is and the better it performs. So how can we minimize our risk? Well, we can avoid some of the known factors that we have. We can maintain a healthy weight, um, live an active lifestyle. The NCI estimates, and this is probably a conservative estimate, we could eliminate 600,000 cancer deaths every single year, or 50% of those cancer deaths we see every year, just by avoiding smoking. Now, we can either choose personal choice, and that's OK. But if we want to cure cancer, I don't know that a, every 5K is going to cure it. We have to take on some of these tough topics of diet and uh, tobacco. And I can just tell you that obesity is going to make this pale in comparison to smoking. What we're revved up for and what we're expecting from a cancer standpoint and why this is so personal and important to me is going back to that smoking example. The problem, the death, the carnage from cancer came about 20 to 30 years after the events. Right now we're seeing the group of patients in their teens, starting around 13, who have metabolic syndrome already. They're taking anti-diabetes medicines, they're taking anti-hypertensives, is growing and exponentially higher and higher. Uh, so we anticipate 20 years from that is when we should see them unfortunately coming to my office, which means instead of where many of us might face this question and how do I deal with my cancer in our 60s and 70s, we're now expecting that to discussion to start in our 30s. This last February, we've got the first peak of this is already happening. It has started. 
the rates of colon and rectal cancer is now growing exponentially in the 30-year-old crowd to 50-year-old crowd. It is going to cripple the system. So if we look at, again, some examples of does this have value, we can look at these blue zones, popular uh, sort of dialogue and books that shows where are the people that live to 100? Where are these populations of people who live healthy, happy lives into their hundreds? And there's these zones, Loma Linda, California, being uh, one of those at least closest to us. And the thing they share, and it's, again, too hard for me to even read from here, so it's, I know it's too small to see, but the core where all these areas cross over is one, there's a strong family value where people support each other. There's a strong community where we all work to help each other out. There's an active lifestyle where people spend time outdoors and are engaged. But a plant-based diet is at the core of every one of those societies uh, as well. So I'd argue that we need to start focusing on food being our medicine and how we choose to address uh, how we move forward with how we feed and uh, heal ourselves.